Hello. Okay, hi, Ryan Williams. I'm from Hammer Lab at Mount Sinai in New York. Um, these slides are at this bit.ly link, SSE 2017, if you want to follow along. A lot of the things in there are linked and stuff. So, uh, so I will briefly talk about uh, Hammer Lab and the work that we do. Um, I'll do sort of obligatory some details about genomics domain problems that I'm going to then talk about um, tools we've written to solve. Um, I have some, uh, one particular library in particular I've spun out of some of the genomics specific work uh, that just includes like interesting algorithms um, for doing collections, uh, uh, algorithms you might apply to regular collections but in a distributed context on RDDs. Uh, that repo is called Magic RDDs, so I'll just outline a few of the things that are in there that could be useful outside of the genomics space. Um, a couple quick notes about lessons from managing Scala Spark projects um, and some of the tooling infrastructure that we've played with and lessons learned, uh, and then leave some time for questions at the end. Um, so the Hammer Lab is about three years old. Um, it started to, uh, with a focus on bringing some like distributed systems expertise to some biomedical problems. Um, we have a high uh, uh, emphasis on uh, writing high quality open source software. Uh, almost everything we do is Apache 2.0 license. Uh, we like to use static typing and functional idioms, so um, Spark and the Scala APIs to Spark are kind of natural fit for a lot of the things we like to do. Um, in the present day, we do a lot of cancer immunotherapy research, this is sort of the main focus. Um, we power a couple personal cancer vaccine clinical trials, and we do uh, miscellaneous sort of clinical data analysis. Um, in this talk, I'm going to cover like about three years of um, work <coughs> that I and myself, at, uh, myself and others at the lab have done building tools on Spark for analyzing genomic data. Um, so this is sort of a like, super set of the things I will talk about uh, that we've built. Each of these like ellipses is a GitHub repo under the Hammer Lab org that you can uh, look at if you're curious. On um, the top of the pyramid we have some genomic applications that I'll talk about. On the right we have a lot of just sort of like abstractions related to representing genomic data um, that those applications leverage. On the left side we have a variety of just um, miscellaneous libraries for um, doing non-genomic specific things on Spark and Scala that could be uh, useful to a sort of wide audience. Um, okay, so just real quick uh, overview of uh, setting the stage for some of the genomics problems we're going to look at. Um, you have a trillion cells in your body. Each one has a, two copies of each of 22 chromosomes, which is uh, your genome. And that's like three billion bases, each of which is an A, C, G, or T. Um, Every cell in the body has a full copy of the genome, even though any given cell probably only uses like small bits of it. The uh, computer science analogy would be like bundling all of your production apps into one Uber jar that you send to every production server, and then each server sort of only runs like a subset of the binaries that are contained in that jar. Um, it's just sort of the way it's evolved. Um, we would like to read uh, the information on uh, all of these chromosomes, uh, but we don't really have the technology to do that. Um, what we can do is read little bits of DNA at a time, essentially. So in order to get a look at the like, larger genomic picture, we kind of like shatter the genome and the chromosomes into little bits that we can read, and then we try to reassemble them and get an idea for what the original chromosomes look like. Um, any one DNA molecule, like a chromosome, that we do this process to, we will inevitably like, lose a lot of the information that was contained in there. So we counter that by doing this process in parallel to like millions of cells. And uh, if we sequence, we sample enough tiny bits from this sort of like fragmented soup, we can on average like cover any given region of the genome with enough, enough depth that we can get a reasonable consensus about what was there. Um, so that's just sort of the state of things in 2017. Everything from the middle of this slide and onwards in the talk is essentially totally computational. Like the, Top of this slide to the middle is like a lot of complicated um, sequencing chemistry that happens. And then uh, we just deploy a variety of algorithms, uh, algorithms and tools um, from the middle part onwards to reassemble the genome and to identify and compare the variants that were found therein. Um, so this process is complicated because 
the genome is sort of a mess. Um, there's like excessive rep uh, repetitiveness in the, um, in, in the genome. Um, it's, uh, there's like 20% of the human genome is uh, retrotransposons, which are like these little DNA, parasitic regions of DNA that sort of are the, so the source code for a program that when the cell kind of opens the double helix and runs the, uh, the, the program described by this DNA, it basically builds a small machine that goes and inserts a copy of that source code somewhere else in the genome. And so that's just happened like hundreds of thousands of times across the human genome and we're just all carrying around this uh, quote unquote junk uh, that's just been around uh, for uh, evolutionary time. Uh, like one in particular is like 100,000 copies of it and it's 7,000 base pairs long. Um, we have other like repetitive structures like pseudogenes, which is just where like one actual gene, which can be a much larger segment of the genome, uh, has sort of like been duplicated maybe to another chromosome. And uh, now that you have two copies, like uh, one of them can sort of drift evolutionarily and you still have one copy doing the actual functional thing that uh, was required. And so you get these two things that one maybe is not even functional anymore. They look really similar because they were originally a duplication of the same part of the genome, but uh, they're also like different in some ways. And so it just makes it very hard to kind of uh, combine back a picture of what the whole genome looked like from these like short fragments that we can actually sequence. And that just generates like a lot of computational work. Um, that lots of people have spent a lot of time trying to solve as best we can. Uh, and some of the, what follows will touch on some bits of that. Um, here's just like a schematic of like some of the problems you run into when you try, you have like a bunch of like uh, <clears throat> regions that could have come from many parts of the genome and you're trying to stitch back together what the genome looked like from these overlaps. You get these kinds of cycles uh, that appear um, that are kind of hard to resolve into like a nice linear genome. I'm not really going to talk about uh, how people do that, but lots of cool software has been written and beautiful visualizations that let you like see like how hard this is and what how messy the data can be. Um, but mostly we're going to talk about stuff that happens downstream of this, where uh, we essentially have taken all these um, short fragments of DNA that are usually like 100 bases long, and uh, which are like sort of the horizontal gray bars in this picture. Um, and we've kind of mapped them to some consensus sequence, which you see along the top of this slide. Um, for the most part, uh, in any given part of the genome, everything is going to agree with like this reference sequence on the top. Like most parts of the genome are the same from person to person. Uh, most of it is not uh, variable, in, at least in data that we've observed. Um, and so. Uh, we can kind of look at this and see that at least in this window, wh whatever person this DNA was sequenced from like just matches the reference. There are no detectable mutations, like nothing to see here, move on. Um, the, the couple like little like green A's and things represent like places where a read had a base that different, differed from the reference at that position. Um, in these cases here, we would look at those and say those are likely sequencing errors because in any one of these columns, there's like a lot of evidence for, there's a lot of reads that match the reference. Uh, so nothing looks too suspicious here, like it could be an actual underlying mutation. Um, and the, the sort of top middle bar shows how, uh, how many reads cover each part of the genome at each of these positions, which is something that is also important just to know how good your consensus is at a given position, how sure you are that the person matches the reference there or doesn't, um, something we'll also talk about in a bit. Um, so a quick sort of back of the envelope, just um, numbers related to storing and processing human genomes in software. Um, so the genome is three billion base pairs. Um, in theory, each base pair is one of four possibilities. So you can represent it with two bits. So you can fit uh, four bases in a byte. So three billion base pairs should take 750 megabytes of storage. Um, you can imagine like an optimization on this, which is if, if, you're, if you're storing many people's genomes, because maybe 1% of them would ever be unique from person to person, that you could kind of like compress that down. And if you're, you could sort of like amortize out the fixed cost of like the first genome costing 750 megabytes and each marginal genome that you stored in this imaginary compressed structure that held multiple genomes would only maybe add seven megabytes of information. Um, so if everyone saw Cotton's talk, uh, his keynote yesterday, 
um, the Hale project is sort of starting from the point where they have distilled the, uh, a given person's genome down to that sort of like few megabytes of raw information. Um, a lot of the stuff I'm looking at is sort of upstream of that, where it's a lot noisier and there's a lot more data, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but so maybe in some like fantasy world where we've sequenced like seven billion people's genomes, we could put that all in one sort of data structure that was like intelligently compressed in these ways and would cost about 50 petabytes to store, um, which is not insane. Um, and so uh, we, we may live in this world in like, I don't know, 10 years or something, maybe not 7 billion, but um, a lot of the, the trends are moving in that direction. Anyway, this is all kind of uh, like not relevant to what actually happens today. It's just a fun theoretical exercise. Uh, what a genome actually looks like when we sequence it today is like we have like, usually a whole genome sequencing will give us a, a billion of these 100 base long short reads. Um, which is uh, like 100 billion sequence bases. Because the genome is 3 billion bases long, that means that any given region of the genome, on average, will, be, will have about 30 reads that cover it. And that's, kind of, that's sort of why we sequenced about a billion of these short reads, is because 30 is a number that uh, modulo some variance in how, much, how many reads actually cover any given part of the genome. Like it's average 30, enough of the genome is covered at at least 20 depth. And that gives you enough statistical power to say like a certain thing you might want to say. Um, this is sort of just, uh, and you're, you're sort of weighing that against the cost, the marginal cost of sequencing more deeply. And so people just kind of like, so a standard number to do is uh, a billion reads and 30x coverage. Um, we also store like the quality information of how sure the sequencer was of the base that it thinks that it read um, at each position, which is more like a byte of information. So we get something like a byte of information we store per sequenced base and 100 billion sequenced bases. So it's like 100 gigabytes to store a whole uh, genome sequencing run. And then we run some you know, computational tools that distills it down to just like the few megabytes of information that's actually there and distinct from person to person. But um, if you found yourself, as we sometimes do, in a situation where you're dealing with, like, at this level of the data, multiple genomes, um, you're quickly getting into a sort of like cluster scale compute territory. And there are like massive population sequencing projects that deal with like 100 or 100,000 100, genomes that um, get to like terabyte and petabyte levels. So there's a clear impetus to want to use like tools like Spark and do sort of like things um, on computer clusters as opposed to just like uh, using clever algorithmic tricks to run things on you know your workstation under your desk or whatever. Um, so that some of the background for uh, how we thought about approaching some of these problems. I'll briefly talk about two libraries that we've built that um, uh, solve specific genomic applications. Uh, one that we focused on a lot is for this problem, which is called somatic mutation calling. And this is basically just like uh, we want to um, not just sequence a person's genome, but we want to sequence the genome of like cancer cells that um, they are afflicted with. Um, and we want to identify mutations that are specific to the cancer cells uh, so that we can potentially devise treatments downstream that um, are informed by the specific mutations that the cancer cells have that the normal cells do not. Um, so in this picture, we have like the reference along the very top, uh, some short reads from normal DNA cells along the sort of like less top, top part, uh, and the uh, reads from the tumor cells along the bottom. And so circled is sort of like kind of the cleanest platonic ideal of a somatic mutation or a mutation that is specific to cancer cells where we basically see that the normal cells all match the reference, which has a G. And in the tumor cells, about half of them are showing a C. And that half is because there are two copies of whatever chromosome we're looking at here. And so this basically says the cancer cells pretty much uniformly have one of the copies of the chromosome has a C there and not a G. And so that's useful for us and we want to output that. So we basically want to do this um, across the whole genome. So it's like 3 billion sites. And so we'd like to sort of parallelize that computation. Um, you know, identifying a mutation like this at one site versus the site next to it or next to that or like within a, there's a small amount of locality that is maybe relevant or like depending what else you're seeing around, whether there's evidence for a mutation in your immediate local context on the genome, that might inform your opinion about whether there's a mutation at the site you're currently looking at. But in general, we can make this call independent of something that's happening farther away on the same chromosome or on a completely different chromosome. So the task is sort of like embarrassingly parallelizable and uh, well-suited to a distributed runtime like Spark. Um, 
So we have written this uh, piece of software called Guacamole, which does somatic mutation calling on Spark. Um, the main thing uh, that we want to get to in order to call somatic mutations uh, is called a pileup, is sort of like the logical abstraction. And that the pileup is, uh, you can think of it as kind of like the vertical column in this picture, where you have like a position on the genome as well as all the reads that overlap that position. Um, and so you start with all these reads and you want to sort of like pivot that data set and iterate over it in a way where you just get each locus and then all the reads that overlap that locus. Um, and it turns out, like, based on the uh, specifics of how you do that pivoting, you can um, have the, the performance implications can be dramatically different. And so we've put a lot of work into, like, doing that efficiently and stuff. Um, so just sketching out sort of how that piece of software works. Um, we basically want to get to step three, which is we build the pileups. And the pileups are the thing that we sort of pass to step four, which is just sort of the, the, the sort of business logic here that's just going to wake up and say, OK, you've given me this pile of reads that overlaps this position. I see some evidence for a mutation, or I do not. Um, so steps one and two are kind of like the spark heavy lifting that gets us to that point. Um, so uh, <laughs> working backwards a little bit, like step two is we're basically going to inevitably have to do an all to all shuffle of the read data. Um, like a typical situation is we have one data set, which is all the normal cell reads, and another data set, which is all the tumor cell reads. They were like sequenced separately. And so, uh, but steps three and four kind of want, for a given locus, they want to consider both the normal and tumor reads for a site. So you're going to inevitably have to kind of shift, uh, ship the, the reads all around. And so deciding which reads are going to go where, how many reads are going to go to which partition from each data set, and stuff is kind of uh, where the interesting bits happen. So step one is basically just like, let's look at the data and decide on a partitioning of the genome that we can then partition the reads according to in order to uh, perform steps three and four. And one thing we want to optimize when we do that partitioning of the reads, when we shuff shuffle the reads around, is um, we'd like to minimize the skew. We'd like approximately the same number of reads to go to each partition so that we don't have like sort of hot potatoes uh, in our uh, cluster where like one machine gets um, sort of deluged with too much data and performs poorly and causes the, the wheels of the whole thing to grind to a halt. Um, so uh, that's, so in, ensuring that we will not run into that situation is kind of the first thing that we do where we go over all of the reads. We kind of just like add up the coverage depth at every locus of the genome. Uh, it's just basically word count. You know, for each read, it overlaps these 100 positions. So you omit that locus, comma, one. And you sort of sum that over all of your data. And you get each locus, comma, the depth of coverage at that locus, the number of reads that overlap that part of the genome. And that if you include this locus in a given partition, that's how many reads are going to get shipped there in the, the second step. Um, so once we, once we build that, we sort of then iterate over those like locus, comma, coverage depth tuples, sort of like um, grouping adjacent loci together and counting up how many reads will uh, eventually be shipped to a partition that is defined by those loci until we hit some configurable maximum. Like let's say we don't want more than a million of the billion reads to go to any one machine. Uh, so we just kind of like step through the loci looking at their coverage depth and sort of like emit one uh, finished partition genomic range that the reads can be sent to and then start fr back from zero uh, and count the loci again until we have another one and then we sort of like have this partitioning of the genome that we can send all the reads around according to. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, and one uh, nuance in here is like sometimes we'll just get like extremely high depth uh, regions that we generally just throw away. It usually means like something has gone wrong upstream to lead to the, you know, a million reads being mapped to one location or something. Uh, it could be one of these excessively repetitive regions, for example. Um, so once we have a, par a partitioning of the genome that we uh, believe will give us an, a satisfying partitioning of the reads, we partition the reads according to that partitioning of the genome. And uh, one interesting bit that happens here where we have to kind of dig into the Spark internals a bit to make things work correctly is um, that you, you will inevitably have reads that straddle the partition boundaries. Um, and so for, in order for a, lo a locus on each side of the partition to get its full like, pileup that it wants, you kind of need that read to have a copy of itself sent to each of the partitions that it overlaps. 
Um, so this sort of like breaks some of the in, the the uh, clean RDD abstraction that is as is canonically presented by Spark because we create this like uh, ephemeral RDD in the middle of our computation that has some specific records duplicated and we know which ones those are and we know where they are and we know why we duplicated them. We just kind of have to keep track of that until we sort of like get through the pileup stage and, and resolve that like inconsistency. In that middle step, you know, it wouldn't be uh, semantically meaningful to do something like an RDD.count or something. So we kind of have the RDD wrapped in a different object that exposes just the methods that make sense at that point, which is basically just like move along to the point where you have an RDD of pileups. Um, so anyway, that's uh, some nuance there, but then uh, at that point you're basically done and you can just kind of go over and look at the uh, stream through and look at the pileups and just apply your function that's gonna say, oh yes, there is a mutation here or there isn't, and it doesn't really have to worry about the, all of this um, shuffling and stuff that happened upstream of it. Um, so that's guacamole. Uh, and the second thing I'll just talk quickly about is a repository called Pageant. Um, all these things are on the Hammer Lab uh, org on GitHub, so you can kind of check them out in your own time if you like. Um, this is just doing like a QC analysis uh, called joint coverage depth analysis. So the problem here is like we may have sampled, we may have like, uh, well, any given sequencing we do of somebody's genome, we, we want to know how much of the genome or how much of a specific subset of the genome that we were trying to sequence uh, was covered at a given depth, uh, how many reads overlap, uh, how, uh, how many positions at that depth or whatever. So this is like, you can see sort of like, this is like two samples that have their independent histograms of what that looks like, but we sort of sometimes want that, we want the joint distribution. We want to know like, oh, here we sequence the patient's normal uh, DNA as well as tumor DNA, and we want to know how many of the loci that we care about have at least 10 coverage in the normal and 15 coverage in the tumor because that's like will give us a certain statistical power for an analysis that we want to do. Um, so this is the plot that we like are ultimately generating here. And then I'll talk about the algorithm that generates it. Um, sort of like the bird's eye view on the left is saying like, okay, so like 10 or I guess the, the X, 15 depth on the tumor sample and 10 depth on the normal sample is the y-axis and then the z-axis is like 75, uh, excuse me, 95% uh, of the genome or of the targets in the genome were covered at at least that depth. Um, so it's sort of a like cumulative distribution of like how many loci have like at least a certain amount of coverage from each sample. Um, and this is, these, these plots are generated with Plotly, which I just love because it lets, gets you like a three-dimensional if you want and like interactive plots in your browser, which I really appreciate. So I just thought I'd show that. Um, so a quick sketch of the algorithm that does this. Uh, first, we basically go over um, the genome, kind of like I described before. It's just like word count, except the values here are sort of like a, a two tuple um, where we're just adding up, uh, we're just calculating the normal and tumor depth for every locus. So for the normal samples, we, we emit one comma zero. For the tumor samples, we emit zero comma one. And then we just sort of like add up all of the like one comma zeros and zero comma ones uh, over the whole data set. And so then that gives us a, uh, a mapping of like locus to its normal depth and tumor depth. Uh, and then we create a histogram of that data. So we're, we want to map from the, a specific normal depth and tumor depth, like 10 comma 15 to the number of loci that had exactly that depth. So we just kind of like take the values from the previous uh, RDD and we just do a word count on those. We add up, so we compute how many loci have exactly that normal and tumor depth. Um, so that's straightforward. And then we want to basically do this sort of like uh, prefix sum, this sort of, we're going from the, the PDF to the CDF of a, this underlying distribution where we want to say, not just how many had 10 comma 15, but had at least 10 and at least 15. Um, and so for that, I have a quick web demo that we will try to, yeah, all right, I think this will work. Um, I just, so, so I wrote this algorithm to do this two-dimensional prefix sum, and it was like uh, somewhat interesting. I'll try to walk through how it works. So the, the problem space here is we basically have like the, the axes are your normal depth and your tumor depth, uh, and then the numbers in this like sparse array are the number of loci that had exactly that normal depth and exactly that tumor depth. And we kind of want to want to replace each element with the sum of everything that is to the up and uh, and right of it in this array. And each of the boxes here is like a Spark partition. So those things are on different machines, so they don't actually can't, they can't just like reach over and ask the other one at least not not directly. So um, so the algorithm that I wrote to do this basically first does this does a sort of like cascading sum from the the, the top right down to the bottom left within each partition. 
And then, um, so, and you have, there's sort of a subtlety here where like this uh, 50 ultimately wants to get the 33 above it, which is that partial sum from the partition above it, uh, as well as the 43 and the 17 and basically all these like dark gray numbers added to it. So it needs to kind of get those numbers from those machines. And so how that works is like each machine essentially sends the, uh, its leftmost column to the partitions to the left of it, the bottommost row to the partitions below it, and the sort of bottom leftmost element to the partitions that are uh, below and to the left of it. So this one's gonna send like its left column left, its bottom row to the two partitions below it, and then the green element to the two partitions that are below and to the left of it. And then on the other side, like each partition sort of receives all these things from the other partitions and is able to if, uh, sort of like combine them in the correct way to give the result that it wants, which is like sort of the, the sum of everything across all the partitions that were up and to the right. So you can say like over the whole data set, how many loci had at least 10 depth in the normal and 15 in the tumor, for example. Um, okay, so uh, I have a bunch of like random collections algorithms that are implemented in RDDs uh, here, which uh, you can also find on GitHub. I'm uh, probably gonna run out of time, but I'll go through a few of these. Um, the first thing that is maybe worth showing is um, like this, maybe like the, the hello world of Spark is like is word count and hello world part two is like you try to do a group by and you blow up your uh, infrastructure. Um, and so I have a API that just lets you do a group by on RDDs but set a configurable maximum to the number of elements that will be allowed, that will be collected for any one key. So you can avoid blowing yourself up. Um, and the sort of like way that it selects the elements is configurable. So I also have an implementation that just will give you a random sample. So if you want to say no more than uh, a thousand elements per key and like give me a, make them like properly randomly distributed from all the elements that were mapped to that key and it just does some reservoir sampling to do that, um, which is kind of interesting. Uh, sliding RDD exposes this uh, like dot sliding function that exists on Scala collections. I've specialized it here for like two tuples and three tuples, but it also works for just like any number that you pass it. This basically just gives you an iterator over the collection that gives each element as well as the few elements that follow it. And you sort of like walk down your collection in a sliding window. Uh, so here you can see the elements being taken two at a time. Uh, and like quick schematic of how that works is just like, it's a fairly uh, non-involved uh, uh, from an infrastructure standpoint because you just shift, uh, you just ship a copy of the, the first N elements from each partition to the previous partition and that lets you do the iteration you want. Um, can, I have an algorithm to reverse an RDD, uh, which you might naively do by just uh, asking each partition to reverse itself, but that requires materializing the full partition into memory, which is generally uh, fatal in large Spark RDDs. So uh, we do this by incurring the cost of one shuffle stage, uh, but it gives you the right answer and um, it's not uh, terribly uh, malperformant, so that's good. The way we do that is sort of like we zip every element with its index, sort that RDD in, in reverse on its indices. Uh, the leftmost partition I did not write correctly on this slide, but the actual library does it correctly. Uh, and then just sort of drops those indices. Um, uh, so scan left is, in, is a collections API that's sort of useful, which is like a one dimensional prefix sum, which is like you go from the left to the right of a collection and you just replace every element with the sum of everything to the left of it. So you just sort of like replace everything with this running sum down the length of the whole thing. Uh, you wouldn't want to do that just from start to finish linearly on an RDD because they're extremely large. Uh, so doing that in a parallel way uh, is, um, can be useful. Um, here you can see like from the numbers one to 10, so there's like, like, uh, like triangular numbers, one, one plus two, one plus two plus three. Um, so the way that works is you kind of like, you sum all the partitions to start with, uh, uh, except the last partition, which you don't care about. You collect those sums to the driver. Uh, you do a, a prefix sum on those partition sums, and then you send those back out to the partitions, and they use those numbers to sort of seed their own uh, prefix sum that they run down the partition to give you this uh, sort of result across like arbitrarily numbers of machines. Um, and lastly, I think uh, we can run length encode the elements of an RDD. So if you have like one, 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 two, 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 10, it will be replaced with one comma three because there were three ones, two comma six because there were six twos and uh, 10 comma one. And so doing this in a distributed way is like uh, slightly non-trivial. So I implemented that in sort of a factored out way because I needed to use it at some point in a genomics library, but the algorithm itself is very general. 
you just run length encode every partition. Uh, you sort of like collect the first element of every partition to the driver because you need to uh, basically collapse like here we have in the middle, we have like a 3E and a 1E is the next element over. So we'd like to collapse those into a 4E, even though they're on two different machines. They don't necessarily know, know about each other. So you kind of bring the, the, uh, um, the first elements over to the driver, and then it figures out essentially based on which partitions were either empty or had only one element, which in general should never happen, but just in case, uh, where each partition should ship its first element over. So it can be concatenated on the end of the, some other partition so that if there's a, like, um, a, a 1E and a 3E next to each other, they can be collapsed. Um, OK, we're about out of time. So the last like, couple things I'll say, I've got a couple libraries that weren't pictured on the other diagram that are just testing utilities that are not genomic specific. One that provides some really useful APIs for doing writing tests on Spark. Um, that uses Holden Corral's Spark testing base library, which is very good, and just adds some clever APIs for doing like cryo registration, which is perennially, perennially a um, thorny problem in Spark and also in testing uh, Spark programs, uh, and some just general Scala testing utils. Um, and then I think, I mean, we could probably just skip this, but uh, we, I've, have recently decided that Maven projects, building cross-publishing Scala projects on Maven is just like not uh, great uh, and can't really be fixed and we should use a different build tool in the ecosystem. Uh, Spark deploys its different Scala versions by applying a said regular expression to its Maven palm files, uh, which is just kind of a hideous thing to do. Uh, I tried to write a Maven plugin to do something better, decided I couldn't uh, because Maven has some uh, opinionated assumptions about what it lets you do that prohibits this. I moved that whole world of repositories that I pictured uh, on the other slide to SBT, which is a other build tool that's like more commonly used in the Scala ecosystem at large, actually. Um, writing build logic in Scala makes a lot more sense than writing it in XML with Java plugins uh, because Scala is just like a better language if you're already a person that decided you were going to write the library itself in Scala. Uh, so, but SPT is kind of hard to learn to use and that's a problem, but it's been getting better. So um, that's like maybe two cents about that, uh, which will probably be mailed to the dev list in much more uh, verbosity soon if you, that's something you care about. Okay, cool. <laughs> Sorry, that was kind of a whirlwind, but any questions I'll take now? Okay, we've got time, I think, for about two questions before we need to switch to the next session. So we've got two gentlemen. So. Thank you. Uh, so this is very quick. Um, firstly, compared to like other variant callers, did you find that there's like an increased cost of running this uh, using guacamole? And then also, is there like a loss in accuracy with using guacamole versus other benchmarked sort of SNV callers? Yeah, good question. I didn't really go into the benchmarking here. Um, uh, Performance-wise, it's a lot better than other variant callers. If the metric you care about is how long it takes to run, uh, we can run it in like 10 minutes, and a lot of other variant callers take like many hours. They just don't, they're not made to run distributively. Uh, distributedly. Um, accuracy wise, uh, benchmarking somatic mutation callers is kind of like all art and no science at this point. There's basically no ground truth data sets. Um, uh, I can give you a thousand words offline about like all the nuances of that. Uh, we've done a lot of work about that. Um, but it's, you know, you can, you can sort of like get concordance with uh, the existing callers if you, depending what data sets you look at. And like, I think the, I guess what I've presented here is like some abstractions for just like uh, fitting a simple model that will give you the parameters you want to use to get the calls you want, uh, which we haven't sort of like done that last mile bit of yet. Uh, we've just focused on getting this infrastructure to a point where we can just like iterate on variant calling strategies. Um, but we don't have one specific one that we're like shipping and telling people to use yet, I guess is the, the, the short answer. That answers your question. I have one more question. Yeah, sure. Uh, so also dealing with guacamole, um, the, my experience with somatic callers, the, the longest running portion isn't actually the, the pile up, but you know, usually the realignment around difficult regions or debruing graphs, things like that. Have you done any work on that? And have you tried to optimize any of that for Spark, for example? Yeah, we have like some implementation of like local uh, realignment or like local reassembly uh, for d for trying to call um, like small structural variants. Um, that stuff's not done. I mean, like basically the infrastructure is more complete here than the like variant calling logic. So uh, we have some sort of proof of concept callers in the repository 
that you can use, but yeah, nothing that I would say take off the shelf immediately, but if you might be interested in using this, then definitely like reach out to me or talk to me after this, and I can like uh, talk to you about what the path would be to get it to a point where you could at least use this infrastructure to run some variant calling a lot faster than you're probably doing otherwise. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Ryan. Cool. Appreciate your appreciation. Thank you. Thank you.